Uh, I want to start by acknowledging uh, many of the people who've been such a blessing to our life, and one of those is uh, Bill and Gail Sheeter. Uh, this is actually their, their house, their place, and uh, Bill's in a better place, a better place than this. Uh, he passed away this year, <clears throat> but um, Gail's still here, but she's not here, so um, Bethany's enjoying this spot. You're enjoying this spot. We're enjoying this spot. And I think that even is a great reminder, even as an outset to today's service, which is a very special time for me and for us. But uh, it's a reminder that, that there's people who ha are um, here, but not here, if I can put it that way. There are people who are significant to our lives who might be separated by distance or even uh, by greater things than just physical distance. Um, but again, it's an acknowledgement of eternity. It's one of the things that we do here today. And so I am never one to pass on a bad pun, um, as you know. So I titled the talk, What Are We Doing Here? Um, which is, it's a, a water baptism service. And some might say, no, I know exactly what we're doing here. And others would say, I don't know, I'm here for the cookies. Um, which is, is also a legitimate reason to be here, because they're very good cookies. Um, but we're here to celebrate uh, Miffy's life, first of all. Um, and, you know, when I think about that, um, but we're not just here for her. We're, we're here for, for each other. We're here for us, if I could put it that way. So I'm, I'm hoping that you'll have a better answer, in a way, to what are we doing here, um, after we spent a little bit of time. One of the things that's unique, you might look over there and go, well, why is there a camera there? Um, well, one thing is that we actually, uh, Glass House is the name of the church that we, we do and, and run here in, in Davidson, but we actually are doing a, a strange flavor of it today, which is called Glass House to Go. And I tell you that because um, the summer for us is, is very... Um, full, there's a lot going on, uh, your summers are full, and so we're actually going to be broadcasting from a variety of different places wherever we go, uh, because I really think uh, church is best in the wild, if I could put it that way. Um, I'm all for going to beautiful buildings and going inside them and stuff like that, but I love going outside uh, and, and seeing you know, different places. So our, this is our church building, uh, the entire world. Uh, pretty nice. Uh, what's nice about that is there's no building program. Uh, we won't be taking a collection to try to make it better. It's as good as it gets. Uh, that's really nice out there. So uh, that's kind of the philosophy of how we do what we do. And I, I like to always let people do the what behind uh, the why behind the what, right? The why behind the what. So I'm just going to have a, a brief talk here. Uh, try and be brief, and then. Um, We'll actually go out and, and do the, the water baptism, and then we'll eat, right? Is that the order? Lynn's my fact checker, as I said before. So um, let me just, uh, again, give you a few slides, a few thoughts here. Um, this is what water baptism is. It's an outward sign of an inward reality, okay? Uh, it is not something I made up. It's not something we made up. It's something that's been practiced for an awful long time. And uh, a big part of it, again, is that inward reality. Now, some of you in the room might right away be thinking, yeah, I remember being baptized. It was a really important thing for me. Here's when I did it. Here's why I did it. I know all the reasons. Or maybe you say, I know the reasons I haven't done it. But all that to say, uh, it is an outward sign. It's a symbolic thing. And I think that's really important to know right away that it's symbolic. It, but I am big on this. Um, and again, I appreciate... Uh, your willingness to sit here and listen to some of these thoughts. I, symbolism is important to me. First of all, I play the drums, so I like symbols, but that's a different kind of symbol. Oof, I told you I'll never pass a bad pun. But um, this is a symbol, right? I've been married for almost 30 years. This is just a ring, right? You could go to a pawn shop and they might decide it was worth a certain amount, but to me it's worth more than that. Whatever they would give me, I would say no thank you because it has a symbolic uh, value to me that's far above just the metal and the stones that are on it, right? So when I think about what that means, I could someone else could put this ring on, it doesn't mean they're suddenly married to Lynn, right? It, it doesn't mean that. It, it, that like, you know, it's, the power is in the ring. You know, it, it's not like that. 
Um, but but there's, a, uh, there's something to it. And, and I think I'm big on the natural supernatural, the extraordinary ordinary, the everyday sacred, if I could put it that way. Just things that connect all of us together that you go, you know, sometimes, again, the most meaningful spiritual things for me have been very normal. Very natural. You know, everyone didn't shake and get weird or any of that, but everyone just kind of went like, man, that connected me to eternal things. And so water baptism is that. It's just a symbol. So if that's all it is to somebody, that's all it is. But if it's more than that to somebody, well, then it could have the same kind of significance maybe that I use that analogy of a ring because... A ceremony, I've done many weddings, I've done many funerals, I've done baby dedications, I've done all kinds of things through my life and been so honored to do it. Um, but in that, I realized that sometimes something means a lot to somebody. And I always say, a, a wedding is over in a day, but a marriage has meaning, right? So it's just a day, but it's a day that has and can have significance to a person. And so I'm praying it has that to you. So that's the first thought there. The second one that I want to do, I want to just wrap this around a little story. I'm going to, I'm going to share, uh, uh, you know, my Bible is on my phone these days. Uh, who'd have thought? But um, I'm just going to share a quick story with you. And it's a, it's a story that means a lot to me. It's out of Acts chapter 8. And it's after Jesus had done his time here on the earth, he'd come, been born, been killed, resurrected, and people were following after him for that. You know, I always say, if, if someone can come back from the dead, I at least want to hear what they have to say. And so um, the angel of the Lord, it says, spoke to Philip. Philip was one of the early followers of Jesus. And an angel said, so if an angel talks to me, I'll try to do what they say. And arise, it says, go southward along the road that comes from Jerusalem down to Gaza, this area is deserted. But Philip arose and went anyway. And behold, there was a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. He was responsible for all her treasure. He'd been to Jerusalem to worship. Now he was returning, seated in his chariot and reading the prophet Isaiah. Now, there might be lots in that that you'd go like, I don't even know some of those names. Who's Candace? Um, but... These are very important people in their time. You have to understand that this guy went to an extremely important place uh, to represent an extremely important royal person. And he's on his way back from Jerusalem, which even to this day is kind of a hot spot, right? Wouldn't we say? And so he'd been there to worship, it says. And he's on his way back. Now, it's interesting because there's an intersection because there's this guy named Philip. And Philip was in the midst of a really big deal going on somewhere else. And again, I give you that context because it'll help the story make some sense. He was in the middle of what you might call a revival. I mean, just business was booming. I mean, people were everywhere coming to, uh, to them to find out more about Jesus. And the Spirit of God says, go out into the desert. Now, that's a weird thing to me right away. But what it tells me is God is not a numbers guy. Okay, what it means is sometimes we get really impressed with huge things. And, and I can tell you, I have had the privilege of being at a water baptism where I was one of the stations, and we baptized almost 200 people in one morning. Mm -hmm. Now, I think about that. I was numb to the numbers by the end. I mean, I was like, uh, I, the water was pretty cold. And, and I, by the end, I was like, this might be significant to someone, but I need to go home. Um, right? And I was trying to stay in the moment, but again, the numbers can just be overwhelming. But what you see is, Niffy, I hope this means something to you, that this day probably means as much or more to me as it means to anybody, because um, this is one of those stories that Philip was one person intersecting one person. And there aren't a ton of people here in this room, and there often aren't a ton of people numerically at what we're doing in Glasshouse. But one of the things I love about it is this story, and that's what I wrote here, Jesus went out of his way for one. If you look at the life of Jesus, uh, whatever you might think of him, one of the things I think about him all the time is, 
I got a lot to learn from the guy. Because he went out of his way for one. He was not somebody who had a minimum quota. He wasn't a person who got his advanced team to say, how many people will be there exactly? Uh, he, it was like, one, that's enough. One is more than enough. Uh, and so he didn't have a minimum uh, for, for him to do his maximum. And so I think about that. Jesus went out of his way and he sent this servant, Philip, to go do it. And it's great because it even says, yes, the desert road. You know, the scripture's funny, but it even reiterates it. It says, go out in the desert. Yes, the desert. Um, it's kind of like, did I hear you right? Um, yeah, that seems unusual. And so then the next thought is this. Nothing physical can fill the spiritual. I think every person, and I've met a lot, and so have you, every person has some sense, if they're honest, that there must be more than what I'm seeing. Uh, there must be more than what I'm experiencing. And people try to fill that all different ways. And I am one of those people who, um, man, acknowledges that quest. You know, for me, uh, I've tried to fill it with many things. I might even to this day try to fill it with many things. There's times where you still, um, to quote the great Reverend Bono from U2, still haven't found what I'm looking for. What I mean by that is I have a quest that continues even after coming into contact with Jesus, but I do believe that he has given me more answers and in more better ways than anyone else that I've ever found. But one of the things that you see in this passage is nothing physical can fill the spiritual. What do I mean? This Ethiopian eunuch, what did it say? He said, it said he had a position of power, right? This was a guy with authority. This was a guy who people looked up to him. He was in charge. He was the person who... Uh, you know, much the same way Miffy, she's a professor, right? She's a smart person, right? Uh, she knows uh, multiple languages, right? I struggle with one. Um, she is the person that if she says you get an A at Davidson, you get an A. And if she says you get a C, you get a C. So she has power, right? Somebody can have power. And, and this was a, a person in his day who had power. He, he had a position, he was close to the queen. He was close to the royalty in their time. Um, he had a chariot. That put him in a very rare group because most people walked if they went at all. He was a person who had a ride. He had a great ride. Um, you know, he didn't even just ride on an animal. He rode on a chariot behind an animal. And so he had what people would want in his society. He had also just gone to Jerusalem. Uh, so he had you know, money to travel, and he went to this place, and he went to worship, it says. So this was a guy who had uh, connections, and what you would also see in it is he had some connection to spiritual things, because he was like, you know, I, there's something bigger even than I am. There's something bigger than the queen. There's something bigger than the king. There's something bigger than uh, even Jerusalem. I, I need to go there and try to connect with God, but what you see is he was on his way back. And again, I don't, don't mean to belabor these points, but I think they're worth making in a room like this at a time like this, which is, I know all of us have had the anticlimactic moment of something, where you've gone to something and you're like, we're going to go to the finals or something, and then you go to the finals and you go, okay, that was cool. I need another ring. You know, I mean, there's, there's always the something else, you know. Oh, man, we went to the Sweet 16. It wasn't sweet enough. You know, there's got to be more. There's always something else. You know, somebody gets a promotion and they're thinking, yeah, now when I get the promotion to the promotion, then I will be satisfied. And so what you see in this is nothing physical can fill the spiritual. And that's one of the reasons God comes to fill our life in a spiritual sense, you know. You can have a lot, you can have a little on the physical sense, but if you have a little on the spiritual sense, God says, I can do something about that. I will do something about that. So going on to the next one, Jesus is not content with religion. Now I find this fascinating because a lot of times people think of me as a religious person. My, my wife knows better. You know, people are like, oh, you're a pastor. I'm not really that religious. I'm like, it's cool, I'm not either. And I know a lot of that is, is rhetoric that people say, like, that's so modern, that's so relatable, that's so everything. I'm like, the last thing on earth I would have ever thought I would do is spend my life focused on heaven. I mean, seriously, um, this is the least likely thing for me to do. I don't know what the least likely thing for you to do was. Um, you know, I think at some point it became obvious to Claire that Ben might be good at basketball. 
right? I mean, it, 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 when, he, when he just kept growing, right? I mean, it's like, he's maybe basketball. Um, you know, but, but for me, I, my parents never went like, you know what Scott would make? A great spiritual leader. <laughs> no, not at all. But what you see in that is that Jesus went looking for this guy. This guy may have been going to worship God, but I think it's a great reminder that God is looking for you more adamantly than you're looking for him, regardless of who you are or where you are. Sometimes people have that whole thing about, what about the person who never heard of God? And I'm like, what about the person who never heard of God? This guy wanted, had a little bit of knowledge, and God poured out a ton of knowledge on him. It's never the fact that somebody's looking for God and God's playing hide and seek, right? Like, I'm, I don't want you to find me. You know, I'm under here. And that's a kid's game, right? God is not into hide and seek. People hide from God, but God is not hiding from people. He's trying to make himself as clear and plain as he can. And so he's not content with religion. This guy had religion. We see that. He had a religious content to his life. He'd gone to Jerusalem, the place of worship. He had you know, expended time and effort to go there, and he's on his way back, and he's reading the scriptures, and he doesn't get it. He's reading the book of Isaiah, and he doesn't understand it. So I think it's very interesting. Again, I re I'm reading here from the Bible. He says he was returning, seated in his chair, reading the prophet Isaiah. And notice that it says, the spirit told Philip, go closer and meet this chariot. Now, again, I don't know how you think God sounds, I have never heard God's voice audibly uh, that I could argue for sure that I heard it. But I know for sure I've heard a still small voice in my mind saying, you should go over and talk to that person who's sitting alone at that bench because they look kind of alone. And, and I, I'm like, there's things I know for sure the Spirit will prompt somebody to do if they listen, right? And so the Spirit tells Philip, hey, go closer, meet the chariot. So Philip ran to the man. And heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. So the guy's reading out loud. He's in his chariot, but he doesn't know. Up, I mean, it's kind of a funny scene. You see Philip, like, trucking up behind the chariot, <laughs> you know, trying to sneak up on the guy, and he's like, please, slow down. And, and, he, and Philip says, do you, I don't know if he's out of breath, but I'm adding that. But he says, do you understand what you're reading? And the man says, how can I, unless somebody explains it to me? He implored Philip to come up and sit by him. Now, this is fascinating to me because there's a humility in this man. He didn't say, yeah, I understand what I'm reading. Who do you think I am? He says, no, I really don't. And uh, the truth is, uh, maybe this is a weird thing for a pastor to admit, but I don't understand the Bible. Um, I've read it a lot. I don't understand it. I understand parts of it. I understand, the parts I understand are incredibly important to my life, and there's parts that I go, hmm, I'm going to file that under don't know. Um, but, but what that means is I have lots of great teachers in my life. There's been people who collectively I've come to see the simple and profound things that are there, and I'm able to file things in. Uh, I'll ask God about that one, I guess, if I get a chance. But I think about this, the big picture of Scripture is so amazing because what he, this guy is right in one of the most important prophetic passages of the entire Old Testament. Jesus didn't just come out of nowhere and show up on the earth. He actually, one of the reasons a thinking mind like yours or mine can believe the Bible is that there's all kinds of predictions in it. People say, oh, there's all kinds of errors in it. Well, I haven't found those, but I've found all kinds of <laughs> even mathematical predictions of the day Jesus would arrive on the earth, and they're pretty interesting things. And so most of the time, I would say stuff like that in complete ignorance before I knew anything about Jesus or the Bible. I'd go, eh, it, it, it's just an old dusty book. It doesn't make any sense. I'm like, really? Do you know it? No, I don't know it, but I know it's wrong. Uh, and so in studying it, I actually came to find out there's weird things like Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 gives an entire description of the crucifixion hundreds of years before it was even invented, <laughs> if you can invent such a thing. And the idea was a Messiah would come to the Jews, but also to the world, and he would be misunderstood, and he would be mistreated, and he would be tossed aside. He would be completely brutalized. And in that process, though, he would show the extent of God's love for us so that no one could ever say, well, I wonder if God loves me, or I wonder if God could cover that, or I wonder if God could do something about that. And see, you see this graphic, and the reason that I put it there is the reset button is because... That's what, to me, in a word, in a simple picture, that's what God came to do to my life, which is reset it. 
And that's what this guy was talking about. He's like, man, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. I went to Jerusalem. I worshipped. I still, I'm coming home. It's kind of like after the party. And frankly, I still don't get it. And I think that's a, an amazing realization. What a humility, he says, if someone could explain it to me. And it says, he did. Philip says, let, let me explain it to you. I met him. I met Jesus. I actually walked with him. He's, he's like, I, I'll tell you what he told me. And he explains that this scripture, it says he was led like a sheep to the slaughter as a lamb before the uh, shearers was silent. He didn't defend himself. And in his humiliation, his judgment, he was taken away. Who can declare his generation? His life was taken from the earth. And he says, who, who is this talking about? And he says, let me tell you who he's talking about. He's talking about Jesus. And he goes on to talk with him about Jesus. And, he, and this is what's great. He says... Beginning from this scripture, he preached to him about Jesus. Meaning he didn't just stay there. He's like, check this one out, check this one out, check this out. Oh my gosh. And that eunuch is going, they didn't tell me this in Jerusalem. You know, <laughs> this wasn't what they did. They, they had me sit down or stand up three times and do this. And I, but, but I never understood this stuff for myself. And he's like, I, I think I get it. And so again, Jesus isn't content with religion. He's not content with people not knowing the why behind the what. He's not content with somebody saying, well, this is the way I've always done it because someone told me to do it. I was water baptized because someone told me to be water baptized. And this is what I love about it. Miffy came to me. Miffy came to us. She didn't, I, I don't remember her ever even mentioning, now, have you been water baptized? You know, or any of that. None of that. It was no external pressure that I'm aware of. It was something that God said, man, I want you to participate in this as an outward symbol of the things that are happening in your life. And I couldn't have been more excited when she said she wanted to do it. So Jesus isn't content with someone just going through the motions, right? And so that reset button, that was a reset for this guy. He had grown up knowing things that he didn't really know. And, and Philip, like, with God's help, he like just goes, boop, let me reset that and help you understand it in a different way, that God cared so much about you. There's no extent to which he would not have gone to reach your life. You mean God cares about me? Does he care about me because I'm rich? No, he cares about you in spite of the fact that you're rich. Does he care about me because I have power? Nope, he has a lot more power than you do. He's not really impressed. But he'll still send one of his people out into the desert to talk to you because you matter for different reasons than you might matter to other people. And so this is a great thought here. I love it. I love this thought. It says God only goes where he's invited. And again, I'm reading from this passage directly. I'm not making these things up. He, he's, he said to him, can you come up here and tell me more about these things? And I don't know what you're, if you've ever been off put by somebody who is, has a really pushy faith. You know, again, I appreciate you guys sitting and listening to me, but this is not what I do out in the main streets of Davidson, right? Um, it doesn't mean I... I Someone can't, but I think more often than not, people go all the time where they're not invited. But I think our lives should be such that um, someone would ask what your secret is. See, I mean, when I think about this, um, Bethany, she's very knowledgeable. Um, but she doesn't go around telling me all the time, you shouldn't eat that, it's bad for you, don't touch that, it's bad. Um, she's, she's like very nutritionally knowledgeable, right? So I go to her all the time and say like, this or this. And she's like, uh, meh, you know, that over there. And, and those things make a difference, right? And, and so that's, that's what you see is that God goes where he's invited. He's not pushy. He's a gentleman. And I love that because he, he just basically waits for us to say, I want more of that. More of that, please. He goes where he's invited. And then the, the part that Philip talks with him about is that Jesus paid for the eternal reset. When I think about this, you go, I, I, I struggled for years, I still do on some level. Why, why Jesus just had to die the way he died? Well, I know this way. He lived like no one ever lived. When I look at his life, I, I grew up familiar with the stories, but came at age 27 to see them with a total reset, like a, you know, and went, this guy is amazing. And the, the very things I have rejected in the name of religion said, I don't believe in that. Well, Jesus didn't believe in it either. And I'm like, Where's this been all my life? And it's like God hit that reset button. Boom, boom, boom. But he paid the price 
for me to spend eternity with him. And I've had lots of regrets, you know. I might look at certain things and go, oh, well, Scott, you haven't been that big a sinner. I've been in a bigger one, or I've met bigger ones. True enough. But I have done things in my life that I have regretted, said things, been things, that I, if I could do them over, I would do them over in a second. And the entire message of the Bible, if I can boil it down, is God will let you hit the reset. But he paid the price for it. You don't have to pay the price for it. It's an expensive thing to reset a soul. You know, it doesn't come cheap. And, and God says, I'll pay whatever price it is. Well, you're letting up people off awfully easy. All they got to say is they're sorry and they get a new start. The cross says nobody ever got off easy. And so when you look at that, it, it is one of those things that I can always look at love and say, whatever love I've ever experienced from anyone or promised to anyone, I've never experienced or promised a greater love than that. No greater love has anyone that they would lay down their life for someone else. And so this is what you see Jesus paying for the eternal reset. And that's why it's a red button in my life, uh, paid for with a tremendous price. And this is what he said. And then I'll close out the story because he comes to it and he says, well, but wait a minute. Uh, here's some water. <laughs> what stands in the way of, of me being baptized? And a lot of people would answer that question in a lot of different ways today with some kind of strange, uh, you know, churchy answer. Well, you have to take our 16-week class. Um, there's a 16-week class, and you can buy the binder out in the lobby, and you go, what? Philip didn't sell him a binder. He didn't give him a 16-week class. I'm not against classes. I'm not against education. I love education. This guy had a tremendous education. He wouldn't have had his position without it. But he asked, what's in the way of it? And, and Philip didn't say, well, you know, we're going to have to prove that you really mean it, you know, and stuff like that. You're going to write us a, an essay on why this matters to you. So he didn't do any of that. He said, if you believe, you can. Let's do it. Let's do it. And because of that, it's a realization that the, it's a symbol. So it's both more important and less important than some people make it. It is not required for salvation. It, there will be unbaptized people in heaven. There will be baptized people that you might have trouble finding. And, and I look at that and I go, well, that's weird. That's a strange thought. But it's because there's no right that can make us right. If there was a right that could make you right, if I could like, you know, throw a little something on everyone, and a little pixie dust and everyone's good, why did Jesus come and die in that horrific way to resurrect again visibly to his, his followers and say, hey, the, if, if you could have said a prayer, if you could have, you know, got your picture taken in a robe, if any of that stuff would have been enough, it wasn't enough. So obviously water baptism isn't enough, but all it is is a participation in what Jesus wanted to do. It's almost spontaneous in this guy's life. I love it. He kind of like says, well, there's water, let's do it. And Philip says, let's do it. And the coolest part about this story to me in some ways is right after that, it says they come up out of the water and Philip disappears. Now, I don't know if that's going to happen today. If I disappear, actually, <laughs> send out a search party, okay, because I'm not the best swimmer. But uh, no, we'll be fine, Miffy, don't worry. You know I tell jokes, so don't worry. Um, so one of the questions is how long do you have to hold the reset button? When I call tech support, they always say hold it for 30 seconds. So... Um, We'll do less than that up here. Um, but, but we'll go to the, water, to the bubble stop. No, I, how long's enough? Listen, enough is enough. Uh, it'll be fine. But when I think about that, I think Philip disappears and, and the unit goes on in his life rejoicing. It says he goes on rejoicing. So it's not between me and Miffy. This is not like, oh, wow, you know, the significance of Scott. Well, I'm glad to be there. I'm privileged to be a part of it, but there's no power in, in my life apart from what God's doing. The, the, it's, it's God that, it, that the person's needing in that moment. It's, I'm just an officiant. I say it all the time with weddings I've done. I'm like, y'all got to be married, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying the vows with you, but I, I'm not marrying you. Um, you have to go be married. You have to go live the life. That's up to you. And so that's always what water baptism is to me too. Privileged to be an officiant. Privileged to uh, be there to 
say those vows or those thoughts with you out in the water. But you know, at the end of the day, the unseen one is the one that you are really saying, till death do us part? No, till death do us meet. And it's a wonderful opportunity. This is the, the, the thing. If, if you believe, it's more than a bath. You know, if you don't believe, it's just a bath. We take one hopefully every week or month or however <laughs> often you need to. But um, that's why I say uh, to live a life of regret, not necessary. Nobody on this planet should live a life of regret when God has given us a life reset and said, hey, this is it. So I wrote down these things. What is baptism? Well, it's, it's an act of humility. Um, what I mean by that is we, there was somebody who we talked about in, in Florida with who, about baptism, and they like, ooh, my hair would get messed up. And we were like, I don't think you're getting it. I, 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 just, I really don't think you're getting it. You know? um, it, yeah, it's not necessarily you know, something that you, you might look better before you go in than actually come out. But spiritually speaking, you know, there's a, I've, I've seen just some of the most pretty pictures I've seen of people who are looking like the cat dragged them in right after a baptism. You know, just ragged and just you know, glowing. Um, faith, it's an act of faith. It means that it's more than just what you see. And I think faith, humility and faith are two big Bible words. You know, it's, it's realizing, who am I? I'm just a person who's here made out of dirt. Um, you know, but, but God is huge and beyond my understanding. But somehow, he's given me a little connection with this, and I get it. What it is, it's a participation in the death burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, he could have had us bury you in the dirt or in the sand. Thankfully, he did it in the water. But it's a figurative thing. You get to get buried and brought back in that moment. And that's what it is. It's saying like the old Miffy. Um, you know, we, we like the old Miffy. I mean, I, you're, you're one of the sweetest people I know. But I know God knows you like I don't know you. Just like he knows me like, like uh, you know, no one else. And so... Uh, there are things that you would like to wish away or wash away or put away past your life and say, that's part of my past, but it's not really part of my future. It's not where I'm wanting to go. And that's, that's what gives you the opportunity out here. It's actually a time to, to obey God in that because he said to do it. Jesus did it. It was a declaration. People who followed him, um, it, it's interesting culturally that in many places in the world, if you are brought up in a different religious system, and uh, you go to a study, no big deal, do whatever. But if you are water baptized as a Christian, people realize, man, they're serious about this. This is over. It's, it's done. They're no longer this. They're that. And, and it's funny how identifying this thing is. It's a declaration, um, you know, often done in a public place out here like this. And then I say it's a funeral. It's, it's your chance to attend your own funeral. Um, again, you won't die today, but spiritually speaking, um, it's a time for that. And uh, I don't know if you've ever wanted to attend your own funeral to see, like, who came? Um, like, and did they say nice things about me or whatever? But, but it really is. It's a time that you can look back to. And I know in my life, uh, I, I was water baptized out in the ocean in, in South Florida. And uh, when I think back to that moment, I go, man, there, was, there were things naturally, yes, but supernaturally that just changed. From that day on, there were things that were different. Was everything different? Oh, yeah, I never sinned again. Just ask my wife. No, <laughs> not true. Uh, but, but what it meant was it was, a, it was a, a mark. It was a dividing line. It was a thing that I said, you know, from this point on, I, I've really decided some things. And, and again, it's a reset. You can live in the reset the eternal reset and get a chance at it now. So that's what water baptism is. And so if you're asking what are we here for, <laughs> that's what we're here for. I think you're mainly here to see me wear <laughs> these. Um, is, this is, yes, this is something usually reserved only for my family and, and close friends, so you are that. Um, so the way we're going to do it procedurally, just thinking on it, again, is... Uh, we're going to head to the edge of the shore down there uh, together. And if Lynn needs to modify any of this, please do. But um, this lake actually is pretty shallow, pretty far out. So we'll go a little ways out. We won't go too far out. Um, and, uh, but you can stand up at any time. So you got to remember, I'm not the greatest swimmer. So don't worry. I'm not going to take you out into the middle of the lake. Or <laughs> we're not going to walk on the water or any of that. Um, and, and so the... The idea there is 
again, I'll just spend a few minutes out there uh, with Miffy in a, in a personal way, just sharing some thoughts with her, and then um, we'll do it that way. And, um, you know, this, this is, um, I'm going to change into my shorts. And I'll say, just as a disclaimer, too, that, um, if any of you, uh, this doesn't, isn't just Miffy's day, it's God's day. If any of you, as I was talking, said, well, gosh, uh, I want that, um, then I, I'd say we got, we got room for more. The lake's big. And so uh, this is kind of the, the big question, you know. Do you want to start over? Do I have to be water baptized every time I want a new start? No, that's the great thing. It says God's mercies are new every morning. But this is such an important, important day for Miffy and, uh, and possibly for, for others. But I just want you to know that we do it together. We do it in that understanding of what, what, it, what it means. So let me pray and then we'll, uh, I'll change and we'll go on out. Thank you, Lord, for, uh, again, this beautiful place and uh, the even more beautiful place outside that we're uh, about to uh, participate in something that will have such uh, reverberations, the, the waves of, of this, spiritually speaking, in Miffy's life and in our own, uh, are not even really capable of being put into words. So I pray uh, that the symbol would have all of the significance that it should and can and has and does. And uh, again, I pray thanking you for every person who's here or everyone who might hear about uh, this day uh, some other way. And we thank you in Jesus' name.